Anecdotally, we know there are gaps in talent in this industry. Ask any hiring manager who they're struggling most to find, and they'll tell you those with seven to 15 years of experience. And they'll likely cite other gaps in the talent pool that were exacerbated by each recent economic downturn. From 2019 to 2021, the top 100 interior design giants of design actually laid off nearly 50% of their staff. On a positive note, in contrast, our 2023 interior design giants of design numbers say that hiring has exceeded our previous peak of 2019 staffing numbers more than making up for that downturn. However, many firms are struggling to get the right talent at the right levels to respond to record-breaking backlogs and new project workloads. This means our industry is facing a serious war on talent. Now, when I say that, you may imagine a firm versus firm war to attract and retain, and, well, in some ways that is true. I want to suggest that the war we really should be focused on is a long-term war for this industry to not lose talent to other industries. Spoiler alert, in chapter two of this episode, you'll hear from two industry powerhouses. Koi and I are pals from way Way back. back. And so I love the fact that at this moment in our professional lives, to have an ally and a champion at ASID because it allows us the opportunity as friends, as colleagues, as professionals to not just lead our individual organizations, but to speak on behalf of an entire industry. Yep, you heard that right. I had the privilege of interviewing Cheryl Durst, CEO of IIDA, and Koi Vo, CEO of ASID, together. We explored some calls to action for the industry on not only attracting, but retaining talent. But first, in chapter one of this last episode in this four-part mini-series, we'll be exploring our most provocative question for this next generation of talent yet. We asked each of our anonymous 30 under 30 interviewees in our design confessional, what would make you leave the industry? So whether you're young talent trying to figure out your own path or our industry's senior most leaders trying to figure out how to retain the best talent, there will be something in this episode for you. Let's kick off chapter one by learning the top four things that would prompt our young talent to leave the industry. Number one, the first thing that would prompt our young talent to leave is lack of work-life balance. If you listened to episode two in this mini series or most of the rest of it, you've heard a lot about work life balance and flexibility in response to the question What is this industry's most puzzling accepted norm? If you haven't listened to that, I'd certainly encourage you to go back and check it out. But, spoiler alert, this generation wonders why we can't find better balance. And as we heard in a recent hackathon discussion from several firm leaders, Gen Z is already pushing all of us to do better and inspiring leaders of all generations to find ways to dial it in. Work-life balance is really important. I feel we say it, but we don't do it. And I think we need to start having a better mindset and work hard, play hard, but playing hard means being well-balanced and keeping your mental health, emotional health, physical health, all of that is important for us to be good at what we do. So there's a lot of talks about hybrid or remote work is really hard in our industry because there's a lot of collaboration. I stand by that, but at the same time, I would like flexibility. I know some places have that and some don't, but that's something that our generation craves now because it's just the beginning of our careers were this comfy remote work and some people hated it, but I enjoy having both where I can collaborate, but also be in my little bubble by myself. The pandemic has really opened up a lot of eyesight, I think, for designers and the flexibility that working from home gives you. And personally, like, I really do appreciate the option to work from home, but being in the office 
in around your colleagues and having a full library of samples to select from has been great. But I feel like something that would deter me from the industry would to be cut off from that again and say like, hey, you do have to go back to a nine to five, five days a week. Number two is lack of recognition. Really building off this idea of work-life balance, the second thing that would make this generation leave our beloved industry stems from communication challenges that really are exacerbated by some of these new ways of working in this increasingly hybrid era. This generation is challenging us to make sure we're finding new ways to recognize and show appreciation for the hard work of our busiest worker bees. As you'll hear, it's less about compliments and more about feeling heard and valued. Maybe recognition, because when people work so hard and so much, but they don't get recognition, they feel like they're lost and they feel maybe they're not as valued. Not just, oh, send an email, good job. That's like a little pat on your back, but something that make the people feel like their hard work is valued. Maybe it's a promotion or maybe they're helping you to, let's say, sending you to this event or something to tell you, hey, we're trying to groom you. We are trying to help you become better. We care about your growth, your learning. You're not just working for us. We are invested in you and we want you to be better. We want you to learn more. And then you feel like they're caring and you feel like you want to be part of this family. What comes to mind is recognition, but in the way that people who are sitting behind their desk doing the work, it's having the camaraderie of clients knowing who they are, and you're not always the person behind the scene doing the drawings, that you actually have a face and you have a story that you're going to tell, and it's... When I get positive reinforcement, I want to do more and be better. I'll tell you one example. There's been times where my boss will write an email either to the client or to the partners of my firm. It's almost like getting a gold star in kindergarten. Those little things go such a long way because it makes you want to do good things more because it just feels so good that you crave that feeling. And I think that's something that can go a really long way. And as, as far as advice goes, it's a very easy one. Now, beyond recognition, one interviewee shares some advice as to how to help this generation feel heard and seen and it comes down to coaching. I would say always tap into that creative genius that's inside the newer talent because some people might not be comfortable expressing their thoughts because they just either don't have the public speaking knowledge or the confidence in really expressing what they want and who they are. I think it's creating a platform for them to feel comfortable with their supervisors, the partners, anybody to really express themselves if we're always doing the same thing we're never going to move forward so we need someone to just really break the boundaries and i feel like the new generation really is trying to break that boundary because they have it in there it might just be hidden number three a lack of investment if you too are reading up on gen z stats you'll know that one thing that is shifting is what some of our more seasoned generations may see as loyalty to a company in fact according to a statistic in ryan jenkins recent book the Gen Z Guide, 83% of today's students believe that three years or less is an appropriate amount of time to spend on their first job. Other stats say that to gain this generation's quote-unquote loyalty, you have to be willing to prepare them for their next job, whether it's with your company or not. And as you'll hear from these quotes, this generation is here for it. But needs time for inspiration. And one thing that would make them leave the industry is if a company fails to invest in them or allow them to invest in themselves. You have to be able to move at a fast pace, especially for a client. But also the educational side of it, keeping your mind inspired in other ways. And if you have the opportunity to be able to learn what else is going on in the industry and be able to experience that side of it, it makes you really appreciate what you're doing on a day-to-day. -day. I think as long as we feel respect of our own time, 
and we're able to not just follow order but also express our own creativity really could lure a lot of young professions continue to come into this industry continue to pursue this path I think a lot of new designers sometimes they could get a little bit lost when your hobby became work it became stress And it's really important to encourage them to take some time off and then come back with a new perspective, with a new idea that's always helped the young professions to be alive, really be alive and well. First, people are going to say burnout. So that's a very straightforward one. But I do also think maybe the leadership should try to help with that because a lot of people who just graduated, they don't really understand how to express themselves or they the leadership doesn't really care about it so much. So I think that's one very important thing because just like me, I graduated and then I thought, oh, like I, w- I was so burned out the first few years and I lost all my motivation for design. But then when I change to a better firm that fits me better, I feel my creativity all came back and I feel like I really know what I'm doing. I really love it. Number four and final, the thing that would make them leave the industry is lack of diversity. In a recent Monster survey, 83% of Gen Z candidates said that a company's commitment to diversity and inclusion is important when choosing an employer. And in ThinkLab industry-specific research, While 89% of firms cited recruiting and retaining as a main business challenge, only 29 cited recruiting diverse talent as a main business challenge. Put simply, this industry has a lot of work to do. We talk about it, but are we doing enough? So as we look at retaining diverse talent, keep in mind the question prompting these responses was, what would make you want to leave the industry? Yeah, lack of diversity. That's one thing. Usually it's projected more as a woman industry. Why can it be a men's also industry? Also Hispanic or more Afro-Americans, like more diverse. And I think since the design industry is more of the experience and everything, bringing those people to the table brings background experience, more knowledge, perspective. And... That's the thing I will say that could be maybe a long-term situation that could make me leave the industry. One thing I wish for this industry is that we're more diverse. I feel like I'm always the only being a Black American woman in this industry. There's not a whole lot of us. So it sometimes does feel like I can't connect on a certain level. Like I have to work twice as hard to be where I am or to prove who I am. Or I'm getting it just because I am black. There's such a stigma that it's totally internal. But I think if it were more diverse and there were more people of diverse backgrounds in the industry, then I wouldn't necessarily feel that pressure. Now, as we dive a bit deeper with some provocative advice from perhaps two of the most powerful voices in the industry, allow me to introduce our guests in Chapter 2. Hi, I'm Cheryl Durst. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Executive Officer of IIDA, the International Interior Design Association. I have my own podcast. It's called The Skill Set. Hi, my name is Koi Vo, and I am the Chief Executive Officer for ASID, the American Society of Interior Designers. I come into this position with experience as a designer, as an educator, and as an academic administrator. So hopefully I can lend some different viewpoints into our conversation today. Amanda, I'm really intrigued with the preposition around why people are leaving, what are the catalysts around leaving in the industry, and then how that could be related to equity, inclusion, and belonging. Just last week, I was with some students at Tennessee State University. It's one of the few HBCUs that has an interior design program. And one of the students actually asked the question, how will I be perceived as a designer. She's coming from an HBCU where she is surrounded 
by people who look like her. She's being educated by people who look like her. And she is acutely aware that she's entering an industry where she won't have that same sense of representation. And so she's being very discerning. She's in her junior year. And she's being very discerning about the firms that she's looking at for internship possibilities, long-term job possibilities. And what she's not seeing is the depth and breadth of diversity that we know is aspirational for so many firms. And whether it is race or ethnicity or gender, we all look for inclusion in the workplace. I think as a result of the pandemic, the workplace has become a lot more personal. And so these attributes are more nearer and dearer to our hearts, finding those places where we feel included, a part of, seen and heard, and our experiences recognized and acknowledged, especially in design, because we are translating and interpreting the experiences of others into the physical space. I'll just add, Cheryl and I talk about this quite a bit. It's a huge issue that we have to look at holistically. You know, we talk about the current issue, which is you have these firms and their human resource departments saying there's this huge challenge of us trying to hire as many diverse designers we can into our company. And here they are competing with a very small pool of applicants. And so you got to really look back all the way back to the, the, the big catchphrase word right now, pipeline, right? You have to look at the pipeline and see what's mm -hmm. going on. And so... Even five years ago, you can look back at the higher education as the beginning, but really now you have to look even further back into K-12, where you have to plant the seed and say, hey, everyone, interior design, design profession is a viable profession. It's, it's for everyone. And so I think that's where we really need to put more resources into talking about what we do, talking about why it's important to consider this as a profession, and then nurture those talents yeah. at that point. Because... I think what's happening is there's just not even an, an understanding that, that it, it's a viable career path for so many of our students before they even reach the college level. So I think for firms, I would plead to them, although, yes, they're having trouble now, they do need to divert some of that resource into developing, helping our organizations put some of that resource into expanding that narrative all the way back to the K-12 arena and saying, this is what's going on. Here's this wonderful career that can have this wonderful life you can have and it's a possibility and that's where we need to start and then of course you have to support it throughout yeah. right of course you have to do it in higher education and then you also have to do young professionals mentorship you have to continue because then you can easily get lost right and when you have things like these slumps and economic instability then people start to think about let's just get out of it all together so you have to continue to stay engaged with them you have to mentor them you have to help them develop you have to continue to sharpen their leadership skills so they advance in their career. So it is a really a holistic approach that has so many points of engagement and you have to stay steady at all those points throughout their careers. Yeah. Coy and Amanda, we as a profession are not dealing with anything new. We're dealing with what we've always dealt with and where Coy was going, I think it's not fully a diversity issue it's an awareness and value issue. And so for as long as any of us have been in this industry, there have been these conversations about the client, the public, consumers don't understand the value of design. Well, that also extends to if the general public does not understand the value of design and they don't understand the value of a career in design, there isn't that understanding that design, interior design specifically, is a career. And those conversations about career awareness around design shouldn't start in high school. They should start so much earlier. And we also know that kids are making career decisions a lot earlier. But particularly in communities of color and immigrant communities, when your or if you're first gen to go to college in your family, your parents are looking at careers, and I use the word, that are viable, that are vital, and that have economic wherewithal. And design isn't always perceived as viable, vital, or allowing its practitioners to have economic wherewithal. And so we all need to tell a better story around pay, salary, pay equity. A life in design is an incredible life but we need to tell that entire story and we need to tell it a lot sooner. 
Koi and I were talking a bit before you popped on, Cheryl, and one of the interesting young 30 under 30 years that said, this is portrayed as a woman's profession. Like, why can it not also be a man's profession? Koi, you were sharing some background around the term interior architecture. Can you share that? We were discussing this idea of, you know, programs that have, have developed called interior architecture. And, and to me, it, it starts to add to even more confusion, so to speak. And w what we're all trying to do is actually clarify and, and simplify so that people understand past. And so what happened is I think, you know, and, and I, I, I only experienced this myself where you as, as a male wanting to pursue a career in interior design, you kind of talked away from it because it was perceived as a, as a you know, a, a path for, for females. And so what schools were doing, they were seeing in their, in their programs was this big, big difference between, you know, how many females versus male by adding, you know, to a program, I think it was an attempt yeah. to kind of justify a reason, give a reason for, for male students to, to talk to their families of want to study interior design. Now I can study interior architecture because it's it's got this manly, masculine connotation to it. And so that's that's a that's a problem for me. You know, I think that we need to also fix and, and deal with directly. It shows the the power of words and lexicon on one hand, but it's also slightly offensive that there seems to be a better understanding of interior design when you label it interior architecture that it attracts more. And, and we do know that interior architecture is a scope of practice uh, within many firms. It is not considered, however, a profession or a body of knowledge from an academic standpoint. But the fact that many colleges, universities, and programs were applying that term to a curriculum that is an interior design curriculum purely for marketing, again, that goes back to perceived value. If you wanted to uh, lend a gender to a profession, nursing has been perceived as female. Within that profession, they are finding that increasingly more and more males are enrolling in nurse practitioner programs and becoming nurse. But a nurse practitioner actually has a different body of knowledge. But, you know, that again, that is another example where, you know, looking at, at gender in the context of labor, you know, all of these things are all part of the conversation. I want to come back to a comment Koi made a bit ago, which I feel like was kind of our first call to action for our listeners and audience that, you know, as we talk about pipeline and investing in this pipeline and making sure that our firms are also joining in those efforts, getting these folks into that pipeline earlier. Can either of you talk about some of the initiatives, where people can get involved, where your organizations are really trying to drive opportunity and drive collective conversations for the industry? I can jump in with that. In 2020, IIDA debuted kind of our effort, and we tend to refer to it as a pathway program, but our Design Your World initiative, which is introducing curriculum to high school students. And we are focusing on high school students right now. I would love to be able to extend this program even younger, as we talked about, but Design Your World started in Chicago. We've expanded to Miami, and then our third city will be St. Louis. But it is a, it is a summer program for kids currently enrolled in high school, primarily uh, black and brown communities, and they come in for a six-week introduction to interior design and the places that a design degree can take you. And so we have uh, dealers and salespeople and obviously folks from firms and product manufacturers come participate in the program as instructor. We're going to be extending that knowing that college is not part of the path for everyone, but also knowing that there are incredible opportunities within the installer community with carpenters, with electricians. Often installers are the first ones on the job and the last ones to leave, and they are part of the, the customer service ecosystem of our industry. And so, again, this is about awareness and exposure. And whether the kids in the class are black, white, or brown, it is offering a perspective of them to see a profession that empowers them. The program is all about agency and the power that design uh, lends to its practitioners. I think Cheryl said it best, exposure is key. I think, you know, for us, we're developing and, and we're, we're bringing back a lot of programming that will engage students in two simple ways. One is to bring designers into the classroom. And then the other is the, the opposite, bringing students into the firm. And I was speaking 
with Lakeisha Ann Woods the other day, and she was talking about the power of just being present. And so as an example, she talked about being a Black woman in a room full of architects and being an example in that room. And so it's really incredible for us to be able to bring designers of color into the classroom so that students seem to say, oh, okay, so this is a real person. This is a real person who's a designer. Grade school and middle school career days are one of the most powerful introductory tools that we have. We love nurses. We love firemen. We love, you know, accountants. We love all of the, the folks who are our, our parent friends who come to career days. We need more interior designers. And we encourage our members, go back to your, your uh, grade school or your middle school and, and take advantage of talking about interior design as a career. And, and you know what? Bring their, bring their parents. That's really you know, grab their parents, right? You know, that's the other key point, And that's something that we're doing our next iteration of Design Your World. We're going to have a unit specifically for parents. This feels like our second call to action is go to those career days, get involved locally. And I love the, the add-on of invite the parents. I want to real quickly talk about foreign students coming in, right? And I think there's such a, we saw what happened with the pandemic where it was a standstill with, with issues with visas. There's so many great students coming in wanting to study interior design. And then, you know, have, and then once they, they do finish the program, wanting to practice here and not being able to, because again, having issues visas. with their, um, their H1B visas. And so I think, yeah, and I think firms have a voice to go to, to uh, the powers that be and say, we need your help here too. This is something that can, can assist with opening up those channels so that we can bring more diversity. I'm intrigued and provoked a bit by how we're showing up as a profession. Are we showing up as inclusive? Are we showing up as viable? Are we showing up as a way to not just make a living, but to live, you know, a life? And Koi, you and I have talked about this within the context of of academia. I, both of my kids went to art and design school. And I know there's a lot of conversation around even just at the onset with foundations year. And my son went to, to RISD. And the foundations year almost became like hazing. It was something to be endured. It was something to survive. And if that's a message that we're sending as design, that at the onset of your first year, You've got to endure and survive this arduous journey known as foundations, as opposed to crafting a love of learning and exploration of design. You get this badge of honor. That's, that's the wrong messaging. I know that's not the case in every single school, and I know things are shifting and changing. A career in design at its earliest stages is something to be endured. And then we also sometimes hear that with, with emerging designers at, at their firms, that those first years are incredibly hard and difficult and wrong with rigor. I'm, I'm not naysaying rigor because interior design is rightly rigorous. But if we're sending a message that it is inhumane and arduous and hard, then we are doing ourselves as a profession a disservice. I think it's such an important part of this whole whole picture. Our trends report just came out, and one of the things that it showed is that unhappiness is at its all time high right now throughout the world. And it's sad that it took this long to talk about it, but it's great that we're actually talking about being happy, and, and that it, it's alarming that there's such unhappiness in the world. We really do need to figure this out. I'm really glad to see though that the new younger professionals are realizing that sooner, and they're starting to voice that very quickly now. And, and I think employers, the profession do need to really listen to that and make changes immediately. And I think the bigger thing too, is that this does not have to be something at the sacrifice of the bottom line. Artists don't have to starve and designers don't have to suffer. And probably some of the, uh, some of the young designers that you interviewed, I think there is this, this mantra, this rallying cry of know your value. And increasingly, and I've certainly heard this from firm owners and principals, increasingly young designers are advocating for themselves. They are coming armed and better prepared with negotiation skills around salary, 
they are in many instances, firms are showing a willingness to relook at the promotion process. But even before the promotion process, because at the end of the day, you are crafting and creating the experiment or experiences for human beings. And so firms want to know who you are first and then what you do as a designer. And I think continually emphasizing the who of design helps us get to the how and the why of, of design. Yeah. And, and I, I would say, I, I, I think I would be remiss and not say this too, that, you know, the young professionals also beware of context of where you are, meaning I think you should fight for what you believe in. And I think you should fight for your work, but also understand we are in a business that, that you know, that, that these firms have to be, you know, to attain a certain, you know, level of profitability. And that means there has to be a balance. Everyone has to meet in between. The other thing I wanted to, to say real quickly is I think onboarding is something that people really miss an opportunity on. So you spend all this time hiring, you know, trying to find the best talent, you recruit them, you court them, and they finally come on board. And then I see so many times that people drop the ball on that crucial point of onboarding somebody into the culture of a firm to understand what, what is expected of them and what they can expect of you. And so I think there needs to be just as much resource put into that time period. And that's part of that whole development part of a career that I think um, yeah. is, is sometimes missed. And it's a great opportunity to develop. In that, that knowing your value and advocating, self-advocating for your value, you also have to know the value of your firm and the services that your firm brings to the client and understand why you are billable. Understand what that means to be billable and the value of your time that you are contributing to that firm as well. So it's an entire education process. A thousand percent cosign your comment on, on onboarding. May have interviewed Virch Job in a firm where there is a culture mismatch, where there is something in that culture, maybe their own values portrayed in that firm, and it could be offered. But thinking about what your match is to that firm and how that firm aligns with your ethos, your values, the work that you would like to do. Um, you are entering, interviewing that firm as much as that firm is interviewing you. And I think those values is going to be louder and louder with this next generation because I think to Koi's point, I don't think we have to worry about them advocating for themselves. Right. I love, you know, this is a bold generation that, you know, seems from my exposure to be quite unafraid. So kind of balancing that boldness with uh, a deeper understanding of where that's coming from and also balancing some of these onboarding pieces. I want to be respectful of your guys' time. So I have one more question for you. This podcast is really a chance to kind of throw down a gauntlet to our industry. So if you had to throw down a gauntlet or a call to action for our firms or our vendors, it could be to support efforts you already have going on or something that we need to be doing in a bigger way. What challenge would you throw down to the industry? Throw away your checklists. I understand compliance is very much a part of the work, very much a part of business, very much a part of the work of HR, of human resources. But I think we've got to throw away our generic checklists and focus really on the human beings, their, their lived experiences that we are hiring and concentrate on what and think about what belonging really means. If we're specifically talking about interior, interior design firms or product manufacturers, as we are looking to hire a diverse workforce. What does it mean to belong to your culture, not anyone else's? And I know a lot of people are looking for that guidebook on how I can create an inclusive environment or how I can create an inclusive work environment. It's your environment. So think about what that means in your workspace and place and the workforce that you want to attract and most importantly, retain. Because I think we saw a lot of particularly designers of color and women who were brought into firms because they needed to check a box. So they brought them in and then they did nothing else. They didn't look at their culture. They didn't look at values. They did not look as a, as a firm or an entity or as an organization. They didn't look at what they were doing to support a diverse workforce. And I think that's that next level of what we need to examine. So assuming results 
are what we're looking to gain as we look to attract and retain our next generation. I would encourage all of our listeners to consider their powerful calls to action throughout this episode and how your firm, organization, or even maybe you individually can get involved. I'm positive Cheryl and Coy would be pleased to have your support and advocacy within IIDA or ASID. Design Nerds Anonymous is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Discover more shows from Surround at surroundpodcast.com. Now, while this is the fourth of four episodes in our mini season, we are going to have so much more for you coming up in our next season, which we're already preparing for as we begin to drip out the results from our current hackathon that's underway, focused around Gen Z. So if you haven't followed the show, make sure you smash that follow button so you don't miss a thing. We'll start releasing these results in a live panel at Neocon 2023. So check out the link in the show notes to find out how you can sign up to attend. This episode of Design Nerds Anonymous was produced and edited by Sandow Design. Special thanks to the podcast production team, Hannah Vitti, Wise Grisette, and Samantha Sager.